And we did promise just before, Norman, to come into one of the biggest health news stories from this week, which is about a big review in the UK into the evidence around gender-affirming care for kids who are experience gender dysphoria, whether hormone treatments are appropriate there, and it's something that we really want to devote a bit of time to today. Yes. It's been enormously controversial. Some people listening might remember the Four Corners that Patricia Carvelis did a little while ago on this. So it's become political, it's become ideological, and it's hugely controversial in the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom's only had one clinic at the Tavistock, which has had a huge international reputation for other things in psychiatry and mental health. But in this case, highly controversial in terms of their approach to kids who have gender identity issues and it's affecting their lives, causing them psychological distress. That's really what we mean with gender dysphoria. So it was so controversial in terms of what was happening in the Tavistock. By the way, they've banned puberty blockers. Well, they haven't banned them, but the the advice on evidence-based medicine is not to give them in the United Kingdom. But as part of a review by a paediatrician called Hilary Cass into this whole area, which started several years ago and went through COVID, a group at the University of York reviewed the evidence that they could get from around the world to see what benefits there were. Now, I'm going to come back to that review of the evidence, but I thought it was important before we go on to look at this fraught area is that we talk to a psychiatrist who actually specialises in young people's psychiatry and the complexity of kids who come forward with gender dysphoria and how they deal with it. And I spoke to Associate Professor Elizabeth Scott, who's a psychiatrist who leads the youth mental health research team at the University of Sydney's Brain and Mind Centre. There's a very small proportion of young people, mostly boys, who have identity issues really from a very early age and express behaviours which are consistent with the opposite sex and then go on to develop significant gender dysphoria. So they literally say that they feel trapped in the wrong body and that's distressing for them and their parents. And those are the young people who in the UK report have been assessed for puberty blockers. What we've seen in practice in Australia is really an increase in a different group of young people after puberty. That is the larger group that I see. And there certainly have been increasing numbers of adolescents, particularly girls, presenting with mental health problems who also identify problems and issues with their gender identity. So we're talking about different groups of people and they require different kinds of care. And in Australia, we've actually been very good at setting up the holistic care for this kind of second larger group of young people through this kind of network of youth mental health centres, particularly the headspace sites around the country. So you're saying that, say, under the age of 10 or just as puberty is coming on, this is an issue around boys. You're not seeing young girls. They're not coming forward when they're young to say, I'm trapped in the wrong body. No. So traditionally, this has been more a problem identified in boys. Obviously, we're now much more aware of this issue. So more young people are, and parents and families are coming forward. But essentially, they're a relatively small proportion of the population. These children usually express those behaviours from very early ages. They're very consistent. And as they approach puberty, become very distressed about the potential change in their bodies, which they feel are not consistent with the way they feel about themselves. And it requires really multidisciplinary care of the types of clinics that we see in Melbourne and in Westmead Hospital in Sydney and in Western Australia in the kind of Perth clinic. So what's the story with these young women coming forward with their gender issues? I think it reflects a lot more awareness of the gender fluidity that we see with different developmental stages. So obviously early adolescence, mid-adolescence is a time when young people are really trying to find their identity. That includes their kind of sexual identity, their gender identity. And I think it reflects the fact that these are very fluid, particularly in women. And we've always known that in females to have much higher levels of gender fluidity. And I think our community allows young people to express themselves. So what you're saying is that gender fluidity is nothing new. We're just seeing it. No. We're just, it's just being revealed. Just give me a sense of the complexity you see as a psychiatrist of young people. A proportion of these young people have had pre-existing mental health issues or they are neurodiverse. So some would fall within the autistic spectrum who are really struggling to find a place in their school or their community. So a lot of them have developed quite significant social anxiety. They become socially disconnected. 
They have very poor self-esteem. They often have a lot of self-hatred. They've developed significant symptoms of depression. They often are quite isolated within their community, find it hard to discuss these things with their parents. And it often takes quite a long time to tease out these issues, to understand exactly where the young person sits, what some of the pre-existing developmental factors are, what the external family and social factors are, to try and understand how this has arisen in the context for this young person, and then to identify what are the best path forward for them. We do see young people who are trying to understand these issues. A lot of them settle into a kind of an idea that they're non-binary. They don't necessarily fit into either of our more polarised masculine and feminine role, gender-based stereotypes that they can be non-binary and they can sit within that. And there is now a much wider acceptance in the youth community and the understanding of that. So it is acceptable and young people can obviously become comfortable with that. There's a huge amount of media information that gets fed to young people, which I think is very confusing often. It's certainly confusing for parents. And I think that contributes to young people finding it hard to navigate adolescence. So our job in mental health is to provide inclusive, supportive, welcoming environments that include families to try and help young people navigate these difficult areas. We still have problems with access to care in Australia, even though we do better than the UK. UK have very long waiting lists. So again, we need to invest more in these key developmental transition periods for young people. So from your experience of particularly young women who are coming forward with psychological distress, what's their track through the next 10 years of their life? We see very serious issues around mental health and also rates of suicide and self-harm in young people who are trying to transition, for instance. When you follow people up over time, people are less distressed if they get good care, particularly holistic care. I certainly see young people who have gone through puberty with serious gender dysphoria and really to struggle to cope as adults with a body which they do not feel they belong in. So I think there are major harms in not providing appropriate care for young people in ways that are acceptable to them. We could definitely do better with families. Families tend to get left out. Associate Professor Elizabeth Scott is a psychiatrist who leads the Youth Mental Health Research Team at the University of Sydney's Brain and Mind Centre. In the studio with me is Professor Ian Hickey, also from the Brain and Mind Centre, who's the co-director of health and policy at the centre. Welcome, Ian. Good afternoon, Norman. So coming back to the original point of the story, is the reason we're doing it is that published in, I think, the Archives of Diseases of Childhood this week are two reviews commissioned by this CAS review of gender identity services in the United Kingdom. They're a little bit old, they're a couple of years old, and one is looking at the evidence for puberty blockers and what effects they have on kids and whether they've got benefits, and also hormones. And when we're talking about hormones, we're talking about masculinizing or feminizing hormones in older adolescents who've gone through puberty. And they said in this review that they could not prove benefit maybe a little bit of mental health benefit in hormone therapy in kids going through puberty. What's your response to these reviews? Well, you make the important point, there's a series of reviews that have been commissioned and now eventually been published. One's around clinical guidelines. What are the clinical guidelines based on? Which is, that's important because that's the basis of clinical practice. Now, we should do a little bit of context here because it actually wasn't fully covered in the four corners, which is what went on at the Tavistock because it was the only service in England for these kids. What went really wrong in the UK is so UK. Long waiting lists, hard to get care, and then one clinic taking one narrow approach to care. So within Tavistock, which is a child psychiatry clinic, it wasn't simply gender affirming, it simply prioritised access to medical treatments over psychological treatments, over comprehensive assessment of the type that Elizabeth Scott was just describing. And people who worked in that, who had a mental health background, said, hang on, this isn't okay. We're supposed to be a mental health clinic providing holistic care, and yet we're pushing people preferentially only down a medical pathway. So that led to, quite rightly, this is not optimal care. That in turn led to reviews, well, what's the evidence for the whole of what's called gender-affirming care? Now, we need to break that down because that's got several important different components. The gender-affirming bit does not inevitably mean that you go to puberty blocking. It does not inevitably mean that you go to providing sex hormones or that you go in later adolescence to surgery or to interference 
in, in various ways of reconstructing the body. It simply means you provide a safe and welcoming environment for kids at different stages who are struggling with these issues. And you do that in a way that will encourage them and their families to discuss the issues. Now, it's really important to say... So if they've got psychological distress, you treat that? You treat a lot. You're going to have psychological distress. You have medical possibilities. You have multidisciplinary teams. You have paediatricians, as you once were, Norman, endocrinologists, medical people, psychiatrists, child psychologists, others, considering the whole of the situation for this particular child and be in active dialogue with the child at their age and their parents about what are the options. Wait start a particular psychological treatment, consider medical treatments, review what you're doing continuously in highly specialised continuing ways. And we're very lucky in Australia. The main clinics here in Melbourne, in Perth, elsewhere in Brisbane have done that since day one. The Tavistock did not do it. And that's been the source of the biggest you So know, the critics drama. here have relied on the, the headlines around the Tavistock rather than what we're actually doing. Yes, and they've not really taken into account what the situation is in Australia. And unfortunately, this has been politicised Prime Ministers in the United Kingdom, presidential candidates in the United States, buying into the polarisation of gender politics and using this as the issue, which is frankly ridiculous. We've been very fortunate here in Australia that health ministers and others have stayed out of it, despite calls in the media that the Prime Minister should respond, to say, hang on a second, where they've finally got to in the UK, holistic care, we should have appropriate clinics, we should look at these things, and, and we should have good longitudinal research is where we've been in Australia for the last 10 years. So speaking of longitudinal research, I mean, on the health report, we preferentially cover the, just this kind of analysis, which is a systematic review where you bring the evidence together and they say, well, they can't show psychological benefits, at least for puberty blockers, maybe for hormone treatment. Now, you've got to unpack now systematic reviews. Okay, so systematic reviews, are these evidence synthesis tools, Great for cancer, great for cardiology, lots of randomised controlled trials, lots of big longitudinal studies, big databases of the highest level of evidence. However, most areas of medicine, certainly areas of most mental health, paediatrics, obstetrics, many areas of health, don't have large RCTs. Can you imagine trying to establish a randomised controlled trial of puberty blockers? It's not possible nor ethical. A simple comparator. So this, this review says, oh, look, you know, absence of RCTs. Lack of comparator studies. What's the comparator? Who needs to be looked at? So who's what, the, what's the control what's group? What's the control group? So then they said, oh, well, the quality of evidence in all of the studies that have been done, quite a lot of studies, is of moderate or low quality. You go, hang on a second, <laughs> compared to what? And on the basis of what could we form the best clinical guidelines? And we have clinical guidelines for all sorts of conditions in medicine using exactly these levels of evidence to best inform us what to do today. I think the important point the reviews make is the need to ensure that we continue to have good longitudinal evidence of what actually happens to kids psychologically, social function, health outcomes, neuropsychologically, not just a year later, but five years later, 10 years later, what will happen? Some of the best longitudinal evidence on some key issues comes from Australia. Western so, Australia. From Western Australia. And thank God for our Western Australian colleagues, because they've got one of the best articles to come out ever in the Journal of the American Medical Association's Paediatrics about the issue about do kids change their mind? They want to go backwards, which parents and everyone really worries about. Over 500 kids they looked at long term, less than 5% ever changed their mind. And, they, and they changed their mind early, mostly. Of those who went on to puberty blockers or in the early stages, only two ever changed their mind. And they did that fairly early on. So that big concern that there's a huge number who will want to be something different later on is not supported by the longitudinal evidence. A big, a big clinical concern, that one. The other ones on what happens to the mental health outcomes. Well, you talk about very young kids and their psychological distress, and they quite rightly say we're unsure at this stage. As Liz Scott just pointed out, we know for the older kids in puberty and adolescence, the rates of suicidal ideation mental health problems are high. If you go to one of the other reviews, which is about the hormones, giving the male hormones or the female hormones to the opposite sex, then they said, oh, interestingly, the pre-post studies there do show a benefit on mental health outcomes in that particular group, the group that we're seeing very commonly in the youth area now, but they're not randomised controlled trials. They're not large numbers of comparative studies. I must say, in Australia, we're also very fortunate. We now have much more longitudinal research going on in broader frameworks. So Headspace in Australia, which is what the UK would be desperate to have, about 30% of the kids that come along to those clinics are same-sex attracted. We've created a space that is safe. 
to say you're same-sex attracted. And about 3% are actually in this non-binary group. We have actually created the thing the UK now yearns for in Australia. Now we need to connect that with good longitudinal studies. So, it's, so what you're practice. saying is it's, it's a mixed group. So some are coming with dilemmas over their sexual orientation, some over their gender identity, and you've got to unpick all that. And they've got neurodevelopmental diversity, they've got other sets of issues. What you don't want is any clinic that has a predetermined diet with you. We've had psychiatric clinics that have said it's all due to a traumatic family life. It's all, as you know, Norman, famously in psychiatry, we've always said it's a mum's fault. We've, we've made accusations about the nature of families. We've pathologised things which were not pathological. We've got a terrible history And that's of that. why we've excluded families from the therapy. That's why we've excluded families. That's why we blame families. On the other side of the coin, you don't want to end up in the Tavistock situation of saying there's only a medical road to go down. The individual case variation is high. We are fortunate in Australia we've arrived. But, but we do need to continue to do, and it's very important to say in Australia, the Medical Research Future Fund has just funded for five million bucks a very large national registry cooperation, cooperation between our major hospitals so that we in Australia can look seriously. And the people involved in this in Australia, we're very fortunate, are really serious people who work in multidisciplinary teams to do exactly that, and they publish their outcomes. And finally, are we getting any demand from the kids themselves? Are they, you know, from TikTok and from social media, are they coming in saying, I want puberty blockers, even in a pre-pubertal child, or I want masculinizing and feminizing hormones, and that, that's all I want, that's all I'm interested in. This idea that kids rule the world, <laughs> that 12-year-olds are demanding from their doctor, give me the hormones, without, you know, is unrealistic. What is much more contentious is in 15 and 16-year-olds and 17 and 18-year-olds who are much more informed, wanting to make decisions about their own bodies and their own choices, and knowing that there are a range of options. They don't have to live the simple binary lives that perhaps you and I have had to live, Norman, and in the past and in other societies, they have options. As Liz said, most actually choose simply to be non-binary. A very small number really want to transition. And now we have a society that recognises them. Think we have a US president at the moment that recognises that trans people are people. So social views have moved on and now people are expressing that. But what we need is really good individual assessment presentation of the real options and the real dangers or what may be lost if you go down certain paths. And in an area where we're grossly under-resourced. And the biggest struggle, of course, is the lack of child mental health and other services to sit alongside the teaching hospital medical services so that everyone does get appropriate comprehensive care. Ian, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Norman. Professor Ian Hickey, who is Co-Director of Health and Policy at the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.